Hello, I am Glenn Hall and this is September 2nd, 2019. This is part four of my series, The Mystery of the Beast, and today's video is going to be called, Who is the Beast? We're not going to get very far in understanding the mystery of the beast until we know who the beast is. Now I would urge you to listen to my third video, especially if you have not already listened to it concerning uh, the purpose of the parables, because we will go to some scriptures today that will be parables, and it will be important for you to understand how God uses parables in teaching you about himself. So let's start with uh, Genesis chapter 1. There is uh, a principle of scripture that is called the principle of first mention. So when a, when a word is first used in scripture, it's good for us to see where that word is and uh, understand uh, what the scripture is about that uses that word. So we're going to go to Genesis chapter 1 verse 24. And God said, let the earth bring forth living creatures according to their kinds, livestock and creeping things and beasts of the earth according to their kinds. And it was so. So in verse 24, we had the first use of that word beasts. Then the scripture goes on, and God made the beasts of the earth according to their kinds, and the livestock according to their kinds, and everything that creeps on the ground according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. Now this whole concept of God creating things after its own kind is extremely important. Uh, I wrote a book on that called The Separation. I will... Um, I think I have that on uh, my teaching website, and I will put a link to that with this video. I urge you to read that if you've not read it. Um, the idea and the concept is that God has created everything after its own kind, and understanding that law and principle of creation is enough for me to never be involved with genetic engineering um, and things like that. So uh, it's an important, a very important principle. Genesis 1 verse 26. Then God said, Let us make man in our image after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over the livestock and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Then it goes on a little bit, and verse 31 ends up saying this, And God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. And there was evening, and there was morning, the sixth day. So this creation of the beasts, the beasts of the earth and of man, both occurred on the sixth day of creation. And that's an important um, thing to know and you need to keep that in your mind as you study the scriptures and especially as you study the mystery of the beast. Now let's go to an interesting verse, Genesis chapter 3 verse 1. Now the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord God had made. Now we saw in the second video of this series, who is the ruler of the world, that Satan is the ruler of the world and that the book of Revelation chapter 12 specifically tells us that the serpent here in Genesis chapter 3 is Satan. Now isn't it interesting that Satan is a beast? And if you remember, I took you also to Ezekiel chapter 1 where we had the vision that Ezekiel saw of the cherubim, the four-faced living creatures, it was translated, but it's the same word beast that is used here in Genesis chapter 3, verse 1. And also Genesis 1, verse 24. The word beast 
is the same word used in both places. So with respect even to angelic beings like the cherubim, God used the word beast. Now I found that to be extremely interesting. And I want to share something else here uh, because it, it actually changes something that I taught at the beginning of, uh, I think it was the second video, where with respect to the creation of the earth, Genesis chapter 1, verses 1 and 2, I have always, or for many, many years, believed in what is called the gap theory that uh, basically goes like this, that Satan, an angelic being, fell from grace, fell from obedience to God at the sometime before Genesis chapter 1, verse 2. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and the earth was formless and void. Well, you know, a, a scripture in Jeremiah says God never creates anything formless and void. Well, of course he doesn't, you know, but when, when he began to create earth, you know, he's saying that's how it started. Well, I had held to the gap theory that said that the earth became formless and void because of Satan's rebellion and that Satan had destroyed the earth. And then when I was doing the video, the second video of this series, it just hit me. Actually, it hit me after the video. I think it was a comment somebody made. And I look at verse 3 or 1 again of chapter 3 of Genesis. Now the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord God had made. It's identifying the serpent, number one, as a beast, and also as a beast that God had made. When did he make the beast? The beasts. He made the beasts on the sixth day of creation, which a plain reading of this means that he also created Satan on the sixth day of creation. Now we do not know how long after creation, after the sixth day, this event occurred. We do not know exactly when Satan tempted Eve. But I think that the mere wording of verse 1 shows us that Satan was created on the sixth day, at the same time that Adam was created. Now I want to take you to some other verses. We're just going to look at some verses and try to come to a conclusion about who the beast is. So let's go to Isaiah chapter 46. I'm using Bible Gateway, an excellent tool. And Isaiah 46, verse 1 says, Bel bows down, Nebo stoops. Their idols are on beasts and livestock. These things you carry are born as burdens on weary beasts. They stoop, they bow down together. They cannot save the burden, but themselves go into captivity. Okay, this is dealing with an idol. The context of this also is dealing with Babylon. So Bel and Nebo are idols or false gods of Babylon. Verse 1 makes a distinction between beasts and livestock. What beasts? is God talking about here. Let's go on now to uh, Psalm 49. I'm going to read all of Psalm 49 because it's such a prophetic psalm. Hear this, all peoples. Give ear, all inhabitants of the world, both low and high, rich and poor, together. My mouth shall speak wisdom. The meditation of my heart shall be understanding. I will incline my ear to a proverb. 
I will solve my riddle to the music of the lyre. Why should I fear in times of trouble, when the iniquity of those who cheat me surrounds me? Those who trust in their wealth and boast of the abundance of their riches. Truly no man can ransom another or give to God the price of his life. For the ransom of their life is costly and can never suffice, that he should live on forever and never see the pit. For he sees that even the wise die, the fool and the stupid alike must perish and leave their wealth to others, their graves or their homes forever, their dwelling places to all generations. Though they called lands by their own names, man in his pomp will not remain. He is like the beasts that perish. Isn't this interesting? It so clearly speaks of the times we live in and the people that we fight against now, the people who rule or have ruled the world for millennia, the deep state, we say, we call them. They name lands after themselves. I'm going to start with verse 11 again. I'm in Psalm 49, starting with verse 11. Their graves are their homes forever, their dwelling places to all generations, though they called lands by their own names. Man in his pomp will not remain. He is like the beasts that perish. This is the path of those who have foolish confidence. Yet after them, people approve of their boasts. Like sheep, they are appointed for Sheol. Sheol was translated Hades in the New Testament. Hades translated hell. So it's the place of the dead. Like sheep, they are appointed for Sheol. Death shall be their shepherd. And the upright shall rule over them in the morning. Their form shall be consumed in Sheol with no place to dwell. But God will ransom my soul from the power of Sheol, for he will receive me. I want you to, to make note of that word ransom because... One of the videos in this series is going to deal with this whole idea of a ransom, a ransom for my soul, a ransom for your soul. Be not afraid when a man becomes rich, when the glory of his house increases. For when he dies, he will carry nothing away. His glory will not go down after him. For though while he lives, he counts himself blessed, and though you get praise when you do well for yourself. His soul will go to the generation of his fathers who will never again see light. Man in his pomp, yet without understanding, is like the beasts that perish. So this psalmist, one of the sons of Korah, says this two times, verse 12 and verse 20, that man is like the beast that perish. Now let's go to Psalm 57. Let's just read verses 1 through 4, I think. Be merciful to me, O God. This is a psalm of David, by the way. Be merciful to me, O God. Be merciful to me, for in you my soul takes refuge. In the shadow of your wings I will take refuge till the storms of destruction pass by. I cry out to God most high, to God who fulfills his purpose for me. He will send from heaven and save me. He will put to shame him who tramples on me. God will send out his steadfast love and his faithfulness. My soul is in the midst of lions. I lie down amid fiery beasts, the children of man, whose teeth are spears and arrows, whose tongues are sharp swords. So consider, did David actually lie down in the midst of lions or did he lie down in the midst of fiery beasts? Of course not. He said, my soul, his mind, his will, his emotions is in the midst of lions. He has to be around 
fiery beasts. And then he even, even defines it. He explains it. Fiery beasts, the children of man whose teeth are spears and arrows. Look at the things that they say today. Look at what they constantly do to our president, the things they say about him, the things they say about his wife, the things they say about us who support Donald Trump. Their teeth, their teeth, excuse me, their teeth are spears and arrows. They inflict terror and damage. They speak to destroy. They even incite violence against us with their words these days. And there is a lot of violence in this land, in the land of the United States. And there's violence in other places violence caused by these beasts. Well, I'm back after chasing down a calf on a neighbor's property and then fixing fence for about an hour. Let's read Psalm 73 now. I was just going to read a little bit of this, but let's read the whole thing. A Psalm of Asaph. Truly, God is good to Israel, to those who are pure in heart. But as for me, my feet had almost stumbled, my steps had nearly slipped, for I was envious of the arrogant when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. For they have no pains until death, their bodies are fat and sleek, they are not in trouble as others are, they are not stricken like the rest of mankind. Therefore pride is their necklace, violence covers them as a garment, their eyes swell out through fatness, their hearts overflow with follies. They scoff and speak with malice. Loftily, they threaten oppression. Who's this sound like? They set their mouths against the heavens, and their tongue struts through the earth. Therefore, his people turn back to them and find no fault in them. And they say, how can God know? Is there knowledge in the Most High? Behold, these are the wicked, always at ease, they increase in riches. All in vain have I kept my heart clean and washed my hands in innocence. You know, I can see why someone might say that. <clears throat> it really is quite a mystery when you consider so many people who are extremely rich, live to be old, and their lives are just incredible vanity and wickedness. And maybe you've been tempted to say, as Asaph did, all in vain have I kept my heart clean and washed my hands in innocence. For all the day long I've been stricken and rebuked every morning. If I had said, I will speak thus, I would have betrayed the generation of your children. You know, the scripture says that God disciplines those he loves. So if you feel stricken, if you feel disciplined, then know that God loves you. He doesn't want you to go this way, the way of the wicked. Verse 16, but when I thought how to understand this, it seemed to me a wearisome task until I went into the sanctuary of God. Then I discerned their end. You know, when you're in the presence of God, you discern and understand how things will be for those who have not sought God. Truly, you set them in slippery places. You make them fall to ruin. How they are destroyed in a moment, swept away utterly by terrors, like a dream when one awakes. O Lord, when you rouse yourself, you despise them as phantoms. And now listen to this, Psalm 73, verse 21. When my soul was embittered, when I was pricked in heart, I was brutish and ignorant. I was like a beast toward you. Have you ever considered that sometimes you 
<clears throat> have acted like a beast toward God. Man was made on the sixth day. He was made on the same day as all the beasts. He was made of the dust of the ground. After he was created, he was tempted by a beast, a serpent, that became known as Satan. The scriptures describe men when they turn away from God, when they walk away from God, when they do not walk in God's ways as beasts. Let's look now at a couple of scripture from the New Testament. Let's go to 2 Peter chapter 2. And here I'm going to read the whole chapter again too because very poignant and very applicable to the times we live in. But there were false prophets also among the people, even as there shall be false teachers among you, who privately shall bring in damnable heresies, even denying the Lord that bought them, and bring upon themselves swift destruction. And many shall follow their pernicious ways, by reason of whom the way of truth shall be evil spoken of. And through covetousness shall they with feigned words make merchandise of you, whose judgment now of a long time lingereth not, and their damnation slumbereth not. I'm going to move to um, the English Standard Version. That was the King James, of course. And read this again uh, from the English Standard Version. starting with verse 1. But false prophets also arose among the people, just as there will be false teachers among you, who will secretly bring in destructive heresies, even denying the master who bought them, bringing upon themselves swift destruction. And many will follow their sensuality, and because of them the way of truth will be blasphemed. And in their greed they will exploit you with false words. Their condemnation from long ago is not idle, and their destruction is not asleep. For if God did not spare angels when they sinned, but cast them into hell, and committed them to chains of gloomy darkness to be kept until the judgment, if he did not spare the ancient world, but preserved Noah, a herald of righteousness with seven others, when he brought a flood upon the world of the ungodly, if by turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah to ashes he condemned them to extinction, making them an example of what is going to happen to the ungodly, and if he rescued righteous Lot, greatly distressed by the sensual conduct of the wicked, then the Lord knows how to rescue the godly from trials and to keep the unrighteous under punishment until the day of judgment, and especially those who indulge in the lust of defiling passion and despise authority. Bold and willful, they do not tremble as they blaspheme the glorious ones, whereas angels though greater in might and power, do not pronounce a blasphemous judgment against them before the Lord. But these, like irrational animals, like irrational beasts, creatures of instinct, born to be caught and destroyed, blaspheming about matters of which they are ignorant, will also be destroyed in their destruction. Suffering wrong is the wage for their wrongdoing. They count it pleasure to revel in the daytime. They are blots and blemishes reveling in their deceptions while they feast with you. They have eyes full of adultery, insatiable for sin. They entice unsteady souls. They have hearts trained in greed, accursed children, forsaking the right way. They have gone astray. They have followed the way of Balaam, the son of Beor, who loved gain from wrongdoing. Balaam was a false prophet. He is the Bible's preeminent false prophet, and he's the example of the Bible often gives for the false prophet. But Balaam was rebuked for his transgression. A speechless donkey spoke with human voice and restrained the prophet's madness. I'm going to go ahead and continue in this. 
These people are waterless springs and mist driven by a storm. For them, the gloom of utter darkness has been reserved. For speaking loud boasts of folly, they entice by sensual passions of the flesh those who are barely escaping from those who live in error. Do you understand who he's talking about? He's talking about people in the church deceiving and defiling people who have just come out of the lawless way of life that they lived in when they came to faith in the Lord. They promise them freedom, but they themselves are slaves of corruption. For whatever overcomes a person, to that he is enslaved. For if, after they have escaped the defilements of the world through the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they are again entangled in them and overcome, the last state has become worse for them than the first. For it would have been better for them never to have known the way of righteousness than after knowing it to turn back from the holy commandment delivered to them. What the proverb says has happened to them. The dog returns to its own vomit, and the sow, after washing herself, returns to wallow in the mire. Verse 20, have you ever thought and considered how could it, how could it be possible if after they have escaped the defilements of the world through the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they are again entangled in them and overcome, the last state has become worse for them than the first, for it would have been better for them never to have known the way of righteousness than after knowing it to turn back from the holy commandment delivered to them. That one passage should tell you that everything you have heard about eternal torment, about hell, about all the unbelievers going to eternal torment and hell forever is all false doctrine. Because how could it be worse for someone who is a believer who then began to walk in a defiled way? How could it be worse for them than if they had never heard the gospel at all? I tell you why. Because they are more accountable now. Because they knew the way and they rejected it. They knew the truth and they rejected it. And so they are, they are held to a higher standard than someone who never heard the gospel. Most of the doctrines that you have heard through the churches is wrong. Slowly but surely, as you begin to read the word for yourself, the Holy Spirit will reveal to you what the truth is. Now, I want to go back to the King James Version. The reason I had that version out was because of verse 12. In the English Standard Version, verse 12 goes, But these, like irrational animals, creatures of instinct, born to be caught and destroyed, blasphemy about matters of which they are ignorant, will also be destroyed in their destruction. The King James says this, But these, as natural brute beasts, made to be taken and destroyed, speak evil of the things that they understand not, and shall utterly perish in their own way. I was going to read to you the book of Jude next, but you can read that on your own. The book of Jude and 2 Peter chapter 2 are almost identical. Jude makes it clear, uh, some things clear that are not made clear in 2 Peter, and then Peter makes some things clear that are not in Jude. So it's good to read those and compare what they say. And now I want to take you to the uh, last book of the Bible, the last chapter in the last book of the Bible, close to the last verse. Chapter 22 of Revelation, verses 14 and 15. Blessed are those who wash their robes, 
so that they may have the right to the tree of life and that they may enter the city by the gates. You wash your robes in the blood of Jesus Christ. You wash your robes in the truth of Jesus Christ. Only then can you enter the city by the gates. The city is New Jerusalem, not Old Jerusalem, not any other city, New Jerusalem. Verse 15, outside, outside the gates, outside the city, outside. This is the end of the book, guys, and yet still there's something outside the city. Outside are the dogs and, and sorcerers, workers of pharmacia, and the sexually immoral and murderers and idolaters and everyone who loves and practices a lie. Outside are the dogs. Outside are the beasts. A beast doesn't get to come into the city. So who is the beast? Who is the beast? Let's go to Luke chapter 2. Luke 2. This discusses the birth of Jesus Christ. I won't read the entire chapter, but try to go to just a few verses. Luke chapter 2, verse 7. Mary gave birth to her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no place for them in the inn. Now you've always heard haven't you, that Jesus was laid in a manger. That phrase occurs two more times in chapter 2 of Luke, so it's spoken three times. Because it's important. The fact that Jesus was laid in a manger is important. And this is why now you need to understand parables. Because the birth of Jesus, even the birth, God so arranged history that even down to the very birth of Jesus, Jesus' birth is a parable. Why was Jesus laid in a manger? What is a manger? A manger is a feeding trough in a stall or a stable. Usually when you see a crash scene, you see a stable and you see a cute little manger, like looks like a cradle. But the manger is the feeding trough. Why was Jesus put in a feeding trough? Also, why? What lives in a stable? A beast. What eats out of the feeding trough? A beast. What eats out of a manger? Beasts. Why did Jesus come? Why did Jesus come? To offer himself as food for beasts. As food for you. As food for me. Jesus' birth was a parable. It happened, it literally happened, and yet it speaks profound spiritual truth. In John chapter 6, Jesus said, I am the bread of life. He said, unless you eat my body and drink my blood, you have no life in you. And many of his disciples left him. Who can... Who can handle such a word as that? And Jesus told his disciples, Will you leave me too? The words that I speak to you are spirit and they are life. 
The Word of God is spirit, and it is life. The Word of God came, lived among us, and we beheld His glory, the glory of the one and only from heaven. And we who have believed, John says in John 1, 12, he gave the right to become sons of God. Sons of God instead of beasts. What do you choose? What do you choose today? Will you choose to become a son of God? Or you will, will you be satisfied to remain a beast? Who is the beast? We have to understand who the beast is before we can ever understand the mystery of the beast.